Yes, good morning, and it's great to see everyone here. Um, I feel very, very honored um, to be given the opportunity to share some thoughts, insights, and realizations on the state of the web, on the state of web design practice I will go into, and we will dig later a bit deeper into its foundation, what well, actually is HTML. But first, it might be good to get an idea who is in the room. So if you are a WordPress developer, please show of hands. OK, any, what you see, what you get tools, Wix and those? Nobody, this is also nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, what else do we have? We have enterprise technologies. Anybody doing that? Wow, I'm impressed, good. Design systems, anyone works with design systems? Right. Hand coders, hand crafters, lovely. So, and anybody here already lets the job done by AI? <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> this is great. So, last question. Who of you actually validates your web pages? Interesting. Good. All right, so let's dive into it. I have to press this button here now. Okay, oh, sorry. Good. Huh? All right. So we came a long way. As it all started in, actually in 1989, when Tim Berners-Lee had the idea to build something, set the building blocks for the web, where he actually released HTML in 1991. And then there have been two, two, two websites, really, and a bit later, being 3,000. I came in by 1996, I believe, and it was that HTML, I had a technical background, I did programming in the 80s, and I've seen HTML, this is fantastic to do your documentation, and so I went into that and started learning it. And and we went on, and a few years later, it was before 2000, I had the opportunity to teach it even to 30 to 60 year olds. And actually, I added the teaching element to them because it was them to show how the browser works, but I thought it might be better understanding if they see also what works on the other side, what works under the hood. And the interesting thing was really that they all knew only word processor and spreadsheets. Nobody had a background in programming, nothing. And, and the most fantastic thing that what really struck me was that they started using the alt tag in the image. Why tell stories? So they added the images up and you have a little bit of a mouse and they start telling stories. So nowadays everybody say, oh, you don't use the alt tag. It was quite interesting. So, and, and then we've been, everybody was messing around and there'd been no rules in building web pages at that time. Till in 2000, Jacob Nielsen came up and published usability. So, so and then we start thinking, oh, what, what is really going on? So, um, and, and we, we built on actually. And then we had, a bit later came in, Jeffrey Zeltman with designing web standards, but before we built our pages and tables. So everything changed. CSS came in. So, and then it became very, very tricky where you wanted to do your layout, and it was more complicated actually to build a layout with CSS, a two column layout, gives you a headache, yeah, and three column layout drove you mental. 
So, and the big relief came a bit later when CSS Grid came out, what made everything nicer. And also Molly Holzschlag did a big thing on CSS design at the time with her publication on CSS Zen Garden. So, looking, looking up here, we had here 10 websites, 2 million, and we went up, and now we are 1.13 billion. No. 80%, 82% is invisible. So we have only 200 million websites out there. What's quite interesting to know. But all of that, what we, what we didn't came across, while well, we built our websites. What, what is under the hood? Well, we just be, lived in code. So this was already released in 2006. It shows the different layers of a web page. So what's behind it? Yeah? So it all starts with a strategy. You have a scope, you build a structure, yeah? information architecture, all of that. A skeleton, the surface, that's what we see on the display. And most people, and, and you, you see nowadays um, businesses, when they think about website, they see only the surface. It's like, it's like the old town when you, when you have the Western movie and you have the facade and uh, what, what is behind that. That was the understanding and, and I think this is really great coming across and I came quite late to see this just a few years ago. But understanding UX came, came into that was 2006, yes. So, so web standards in the old days been not really relevant. We, we didn't know about that before 2000, that there being web standards. But with this, and, and we see what we can do, web standards became, yeah, standards. So, and I, I think the new definition by the W3C is really nice. Web standards are the blueprints or building blocks of a consistent, harmonious, digital connected world. They imp are implemented in browsers, blogs, search engines, and other software to power our experience on the web. Yeah, it's, 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 it's interconnected, interoperable, and it is important while standards, it's same as you can't mix imperial with metrics. So, we need standards, this is important. So, so what happened then? We are here now. <laughs> so, seriously, do we have standards and who, who actually cares about the standards? And it was uh, last year when I came across a lady, she was a businesswoman, and she ran three websites. She approached me and said, if I can help her, with her websites. I said, what's, what's, what's up with them? Yeah, I, had a, oh, I have a graphic designer and she built everything in Wix. They don't validate. I said, okay. And I was ring, ring a bell with me. Oh, validation, yeah. Well, I've been running code. I've been coding all the time. I, it wasn't really in my head, validation, when, when you understand how to code about syntax and the quality. So, so I looked into that and I said, okay, Wix, Wix is doing that. Interesting. And then I came across, and it was a few months ago, about a company who, yeah, they help actually businesses to optimize their website completely. They monitor everything, they do everything, and now you believe their website is good. Yeah? So, Preach, practice what you preach, and I go quickly out here, and can I do that? No, I can't. Ouch. I can throw it onto the other screen, I believe, so sorry for that. That must work, does it? Yay, it works. <laughs> I, can't do, I can't go through that. But this is, this is, this is, this is a list of Ouch, I, I did a mistake now. I'm very sorry. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but we, can, we can leave it. No, I just go back. Sorry for that. Sorry for that. Uh, 
back. How do I go back to this now? Ah. Uh, oh, okay, try that way. Okay, go back to here. Okay, so sorry for that. So, so there were, then, then was, I was looking up earlier this year. In 2022, of the global top 100 used village HTML, how many? Yeah? How many you believe? Ten? Zero. None. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is HTML. Um, 2021, 98% um, of the top US websites invalid HTML. Looking at CSS for a bit. 2021, only three websites, 2021, 2022, it improved. So CSS is on the rise. <laughs> so, and, but, Oh, step, go back, go back, go back, go back. I jump out here now and back to this. Sorry. Um, ah, that was here, isn't it? I want to get the other slide here back. I, I just skip it. It was just, just a list. Um, now you see it here now. Someone did nicely the work, put everything of those into a table. And you, you, could, you could see, I, I, will, I will share this document later, that they feel in CSS, HTML, errors is a nice way to do that, all the top 100. Been there, and then was the other document here. Where was it? This is a thing you can't, uh, here we go. No, I can't go there. Oh, come on. I'm very sorry for this. Do, 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 do. Come on, back there, best of one. So, so looking into the validation of the other side, what I cannot access right now, it was just just that this company listed all their errors and. I, I ran them through, and I couldn't believe that. What practice? What you preach? And 380 lines of warnings, errors. So how can how can you perform like something like this? And that makes 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 me really wonder. How can you do that? So if if it is one issue, or 50, yeah, of a website, it cannot be half valid. So, in other words, the web is broken. So, and it's apparently, there's a global inability to produce valid HTML output. How could all of that happen, and why? So let's look at the causes. Um, we have um, what you see, what you get tools, often recommended as free for small and medium enterprises. And in this country, in this country there are around 99.9% .9 SMEs. And they've been given the impression, just go online, build your site, you get tools like Wix, like Site Builder, you have Foursquare and, and all of them lot. And nobody been told about usability and GDPR compliance. They think about colors and messing around with their tools. Then we have WordPress, 810 million websites now. 43% it's increasing, it's going up. But then the themes rarely validate. And even, even when, when you look up uh, in the database for themes and it, and it tells you, yeah, we validate, you just check their thing, but what they present, and it's don't validate, so why don't they do that? Then we have third-party snippets or integration services. Um, they often also provide you with questionable code quality. 
Design system mostly run on React or Vue.js instead of being architect on CSS. So what, what, what they with React do, they render the whole website or the web page with one single page in the back end and ship it to the browser. So then, then a friend of mine once mentioned, yeah, but they run through one and a half million lines of code and you get still an empty page. So, and, and the tricky thing is now, is a frameworks and we should really imagine what happened if we wouldn't have the frameworks. Well, they, they keep it together. Yeah, when, when you start doing this with the whole framework, woo. And then, we have enterprise technologies, no code says so. Uh, it gets, gets a bit out of hand and it gets a bit complex diving into these technologies. And, and AI, we, we still not have that it will fix our flawed code. And I think this is, this is quite amazing. If it will come one day. So, one thing I found really, really important, and probably the most important, is an inadequate teaching online or in print, and, and I've, I've seen so many teaching and free code camp, boot camps, yeah, you're now a programmer, you're a software engineer, in a boot camp after three months, I'm sorry. So, but the outreach, the outreach and teaching when you go online, can be thousands. And I've, I've, see, I've seen teaching and I come back to that in a bit. So, what's been taught? So, why do we need to validate? What are its benefits? So, search engine optimization is certainly affected, accessibility, and security. And that's what nobody really thinks about. So let's let's dig into that for a sec. So search crawlers have a difficulty to discover your content where the content is a mess. There's a code yeah, surrounding it. So and it needs to be correctly structured semantically. Diff, probably best to replace it wherever you can, especially with semantics. And for businesses, well, their, their sites fail. And everybody wants search engine optimization, all of that. So why don't you fix your code first before you invest lots of money and effort into search engine optimization, into the architecture of your content? Then we have accessibility, where well, it is influenced by missing or incorrect doc types, missing character encodings, unsupported text or attributes, improper formatted HTML, improper tables, and improper use of forms. Security, ooh. This one gets really nuts and hairy. So there are doc type declarations they be missing. Escape characters. Careful. So, so and you, you see it often when you even validate, um, it's mostly JavaScript related, what, what pops up is that they give you the quotes, there's nothing in, you miss a quote, bad, very bad. So, it gets a bit complicated, and what I will do, I will add um, more references to that in the documents we've got online related with the talks. There's, there's one thing really, it's the HTTP, don't, don't load HTTP resources into HTTPS. It's just, it's a great opportunity for people to play with your stuff. So, and um, there are some references here, but the other thing is just pen test your site before you ship it. You've got a form or something in there, pen test it and fix it. People don't think about those things, but it's, 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 it's just 
it makes it safe, secure for everyone. So, coming back to the teaching. And as I met quite often people teaching, but sometimes I just, just look, how do they teach? Basics and HTML. HTML is a foundation where we build on. So, the browser is very, very tolerant. They say your syntax doesn't really self closing, mark up. Yeah? The browser does it. Yeah? You, don't, you don't have to think too much. But then you think about you know, the browser, the performance. Well, what does it do there under the hood? No, consistency is key. Absolutely, when you write your code. And giving you some examples where well, I came across the there have been problems with the character set. And I found it even in books. They don't tell you that within the first 20, 10, 24 bytes, yeah, it needs to be set. So it should be prioritized at the top. On the top, you get the English, yeah, or, oh, stop, stop, go back. Ah, what was this now, sorry. <laughs> Okay, just skipped out of that. Okay. So, so, so the language comes first. And then you set the character set before the title. The title can be longer. You can, you can have more stuff in there. And then I've seen, oh, you, you put a character set, the definition there. You can't do that. Put it on top. It causes trouble. Another thing, <laughs> image, images. So often we, we say, yeah, focus on the alt attribute. Yeah, it's okay. Accessibility is very important. But the browser, if, it, if it's not getting the image size, what does it do? It tries to calculate it. And you get all this flickering images in a browser and it shifts the layout around and all of that so and the browser doesn't need to calculate just add the pixels the height the width yeah and then there's another thing where often i've seen nobody uses it really it's a title it gives you search engine optimization enhancement it gives you more visibility on your page if you do it right so Inconsistency and contradictions been things I came across within HTML spec. So now I ask you, what is right, what is wrong? Anybody, any idea? It's an huh? It's an acronym. What is an acronym? Mm -hmm. And HTML is not an abbreviation of the word. You can use several words together. No, nah. this is just where, where it gets really bad. The W3C, it was Microsoft in the old days. They said, oh, yeah, we add the acronym to abbreviation. Then the W3C, they said, oh, it's too difficult for developers <laughs> to distinguish between acronym and abbreviation. So they put it as abbreviation, that's all what's there. They, they remove the acronym. If you talk nowadays to content strategists, you talk to journalists, writers, authors in them, they know. And they're not happy with that, that there's only abbreviation. The thing is, ouch, go back. Hello. <laughs> ah! <laughs> Sorry for that. <laughs> it happens while well, when you use these things. Okay, sorry. We're all friendly here, hopefully. So I have to press this button here. Yeah, you see? Hypertext is one word, not two. So it's an abbreviation. An acronym is where everything is that. It's, it's separate. So CSS, they both are correct. But still, the acronym is still not part of the spec 
And it should be, it should be. Well, while you think about people nowadays, they work a lot with content, and it should be there. And I, I'm, feel, I'm not feeling happy. I don't know how you, anybody deals with content. So, there's uh, something should be done actually about that. So, so both are correct. Okay. There's another, another thing that gives me a bit of creeps. When we, we had recently Corona, and everybody went online. And what, hap what happened then is you have webinars, you have meetups, you, you start, there's no meetup in person, so everything is online, everybody is online. And, and you find in Philadelphia a meetup talks about what you're interested in. And it's across, across, across the globe. What happened now is we have the spec for date and time. And I notice I have been missing quite a few webinars because of the time zone. What they start doing, you got here, I don't know the right button, you got here the UTC. That's cool. It's good having that. Yeah? You can calculate from that. Now, for, for a normal person, oh, it's that time zone. So you, you look up on the website, where, when is the time? Okay? Well, in my zone. So we go from PSD, Pacific Standard Time, or PT, Pacific Time, to BST, or, or GMT. Cool. Now what happens is that in the States, that one changes at a different time as you change the BST to GMT. So sometimes you miss out by an hour. And then we have, as an example, you know, America or Los Angeles. It's probably also very difficult for, for a user or for, for a web developer to get that right, get it in. What, what do I have to type into that? American. Los Angeles, you have, to, you have to look it up and instead of using really the PST. So it would be probably very desirable having the PST, the GMT, and around the globe, them also in that standard. It, make, it would make things easier and let the browser calculate that. Okay, moving on. Second languages. So often we see, and I, and I like to look at those pages, these websites, um, restaurant websites, they're really cool. Has anybody experienced looking at a menu on a <laughs> restaurant site? <laughs> Mostly you end up straight away with a PDF and not even, don't think about the mobile, on the desktop you've got even difficulties to, to see what, 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 what do they serve, what's on the menu. So, and don't expect at that moment when you look at an Italian restaurant that they, they really give you a nice thing in Italian or in French. Do they mark it up as a second language, but it's what you need to do. So, the second language ends up as garbage words, as with in English. And then I had once a project, I've been working on that, to add a second language within a sentence, within a paragraph. And it took me quite a while to figure that out. And, ah, no, back, there we go, come on. There, okay, sorry, wrong button. Again, so, so, so we, can, we can start a paragraph. We, 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 we have here English, we said English, it's fine. That, then we come here and we have a DFN definition. Well, it's cool, I had to abuse it. There is no trans L tag. So, and I set the language to Sanskrit. And that's what I typed in. So, you know, you got special characters there. And I quickly can show you the example how it looks when I have to get over here again. 
Okay, can I do that? Yeah, all right, there it is, the example. No? Uh, it's not displaying that. Sorry. This drives me nuts here. Okay. I have to explain it then. So, so you hover it with a, with a mouse, yeah? you hover it, and you get this text comes out. But the tricky thing is, and I had um, a few conversations with Leonie Watson about that, it's about the screen reader. What will the screen reader do at that moment? And it goes straight at that moment in here into the other language, yeah, and takes that as Sanskrit, as an example. You hover it with the mouse, with the cursor, and it gives you this text. Well, it's good. I came across um, some organizations, and they have thousands of pages, where they use um, second language word within, within the paragraphs. And they all, they don't do it. It's all English, so all the efforts they do, and they want to get it right, it fails. It's just, it's just seen as English, and it's just, and such, it's garbage comes out. And that's what we don't want. Okay, so, code quality. Code quality is, is, is so important. It's imperative that, that, that we get it right and ensure all your code is clean and also nicely readable to others. So when you often, when you often look into, into your code and you see generated code, and it's a mess. Can you read it? No. So become, become also aware of your code's back end performance. What's at the back end? especially using React. So, and, and you ensure accessibility of your code, yeah? Consider your code's performance in the browser, and, and this, is, this is, is a thing, um, if, if the browser has to calculate it, as an example, closing tag is very tolerant, but for a browser it still needs to calculate. Well, it runs through, so it gets, it's it's up to sustainability, and that's all what I can I can say about that. It really adds up, and we, we need to we need to become aware that everything we do in code it gets many times translated until it reaches the core. Yeah, if if you compile code, it picks it into assembler and it goes down into macro code, into my micro code. It gets many times translated, so we need to get aware of that that that, that it's not straight there. So, um, what is quite fantastic right now is the W3C came out with sustainability guidelines, and part of that is write clean code, please. Right, key takeaways. Validate all your web pages to a W3C standard. I think this is, yeah. And fix, fix it, fix it, please, fix it. Warnings, errors, you created that. You are responsible. Pen test your website before shipping. <sighs> Become aware of the security rules, yeah. So, and educate your peers and website owners, especially on web standards. I think, I think this is so important. So. Is it a professional or professional looking website? Validation will tell you. Thank you. You get some contact details here. I hope it was right. Thank you. Good.